Ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention? Well, I'm glad to see, excuse me, glad to see you're all enjoying yourselves. I'm Charles Ferguson, President of the Federation of American Scientists, and it's great that we've had this uh, event now twice in a row here at the Carnegie Institution for Science. It's such a, a beautiful building with such a rich history. And this is the 2011 FAS awards ceremony. You'll be thinking, wait a minute, this, this FAS is confused. This is 2012. Well, it, it took some time to, to work with uh, Secretary Chu and, and uh, Dr. Meserve and other guests to make sure we could fit this in with everyone's schedules. And I'm amazed. It turned out very well. We, we have such an amazing uh, group of people here tonight. I ran into General Scowcroft at the reception, and he said to me, with all the, the leadership and the brain power in this room, we can, might actually solve some problems tonight. <laughs> And it's a great pleasure to see so many board members of FAS in the room as well, especially Chairman of the Board, Gilman Louie, and several other board members. Hopefully you get a chance to speak with them. And also FAS pre former President Henry Kelly, who's now working for Dr. Chu at the Department of Energy. Henry's over there. And it's great to see so many other former uh, bosses and, and colleagues and, cl and close friends here tonight as well. Uh, so I know we're a little behind schedule. I was going to go on and, and give a little brief comment about just how special this building is. Because I know one of my board members, Mike Telson, keeps reminding me, and so is you know, Dick Meserve as well. I've been at the Dick Meserve's office. It's about half the size of a, a football field or something. It's just, <laughs> it's, it's amazing. You get lost in, in his office. You, you, you need a, a road map or something. It's, it's so impressive. And he, he tells this great story about Vannevar Bush when he was here during uh, World War II and there were armed guards around the building at that time. So this, has, this building has a rich history. And if you don't know it, you can Google it or what, use your favorite search engine or go to Wikipedia if that's up to date and, and read up on that. So that's a way of telegraphing how special this place is. And I'll, I'll skip a lot of the text I have just to save time because I want to make sure that you don't want to listen to me. You want to listen to Dick Meserve and Steve Chu and John Holdren and, and Dick Garwin. So, but I'd be remiss without thanking our sponsors. We couldn't have done this without them. The gold level sponsors, General Atomics, uh, we got through our FAS board member, Mike Telson, who's a vice president of GA. Very thankful for their support. Uh, HBO, uh, thankful for their support, both HBO and General Atomics. This is the second year in a row they've supported the gold level. At the silver level, BP America, and Denji Ren, or the Federation of Electric Power Companies of Japan, and FAS member, longtime member, Lawrence Brown, who's actually out in Honolulu. He couldn't make it tonight, but he wanted to make sure you looked at his ad in the awards book and a, a, a new idea that, that he wants to put before you. At the bronze level, we have Babcock and Wilcox, uh, Energy Future Holdings and TXU, and Fairview Builders. I want to just really emphasize how, how special they are. Uh, Steve Hamblin, especially, he's been a huge supporter of FAS the last couple of years. We actually met him at the last awards ceremony in 2010, and he not only is a bronze level sponsor, but his company also sponsored the, the wine you're enjoying tonight. And yes, thank, thank Steve. And last but not least, the Global America Business Institute, Gabby Florence Lowe Lee, who's right over here to my left, 
and Florence is a, a dear colleague, and we've been working together on a number of nuclear energy education issues over the last few months. So it's a great pleasure to, to have her and her sponsorship at this event as well. And we couldn't have done this without FAS's staff. I want to especially uh, thank Monica Amarello for her hard work, many, many hours, uh, <laughs> evenings, uh, weekends, the, all the extra time she put into this. And also Katie Colton, our membership coordinator, that extraordinary work in making this happen. And a recent hired FAS, Mary Kate Cunningham, also helped uh, in in the last few weeks. And it's great to see so many FAS uh, staff also at this event. And finally, I want to thank the awards committee. You know, we actually voted on this, and <laughs> Secretary Chu was overwhelming winner for the Hans Bate Award. And we've had the Hans Bate Award for about the last 10 years, and there was no one even close. So uh, it, it was, you know, without a doubt, we, we wanted you here. And Richard Reserve, it's, it's a great honor to have him as the inaugural recipient of the Richard L. Garman Award, and you'll hear more about that in a few moments. Finally, I want to, th I want to introduce Dr. John Holdren, the President's Chief Science Advisor. He was the award recipient for the Hans Bethe Award last time we gave this, and he also is the award winner for our Public Service Award uh, some years ago. So it's, it's very fitting to have uh, John to come up here now and serve as the Master of Ceremonies and introduce uh, Richard Garman. Here's a, thank you, Kit. Oh, thank you so much. Well, thank you very much, Charles. He was kind enough to say, or to omit, that it was 1979 when I received the Public Service Award of the uh, Federation of American Scientists. Uh, and we won't reflect any longer on what that says about my age. Um, I had actually prepared 45 minutes of remarks for this evening, but uh, Steve Chu told me I mustn't do it because it would cut into his time. And um, so I won't, uh, I won't do that. But it is an enormous pleasure uh, to be back here at this uh, amazing FAS award ceremony uh, with so many leaders in science, technology, and public policy uh, around the room, leaders from the academic sector, the NGO sector, the government sector, the private sector, the philanthropic sector. It's really an amazing group of people here, and, and it's really an honor to be uh, in front of you. I want to recognize a few uh, folks who are here, it's always dangerous to start recognizing people because everybody in the room deserves uh, recognition. But I want to recognize Congressman Rush Holt, who is a fellow plasma physicist and rocket scientist. Uh, certainly, uh, certainly one of the best friends that science and technology have ever had in the United States Congress. Um, I want to recognize Tom D'Agostino, the head of the National Nuclear Security Administration, who's here. Uh, who's here tonight. Uh, Greg Yasko, who's the uh, Nuclear Regulatory Commission Chair, is here tonight. Uh, General Brent Scowcroft, who needs no introduction in this group, fabulous uh, leader in this, uh, in, this, in this field. And I thought we were going to have two members of the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology here tonight, but I don't see Jim Gates. I do see Rosina Bierbaum, member of PCAST, uh, and the, the head of a very important study for President Obama on, on natural capital, biodiversity, and sustainability. Rosina, thank you for your service. But it is now uh, my great pleasure uh, to introduce Dick Garwin, for whom the Richard L. Garwin Award is named. And what I'm not going to do is uh, read Dick's bio to you, because it's, it's in your program. It's very long. Uh, he has had an absolutely amazing career. I struggled with how to characterize uh, Dick Garwin in these brief remarks. I'm going to try it. Uh, I'll start by saying that 
really, as everybody in this room already knows, Dick is formidably smart. He's famously inventive. He is public spirited to a fault. Uh, he has made his remarkable mind available to, has put his mind at the service of not only IBM and several of our country's leading universities, but the national laboratories, several presidents, the directors of central intelligence over many administrations, secretaries of defense over many administrations, the national academies, non-governmental organizations, including conspicuously the FAS, the Union of Concerned Scientists, the Pugwash Conferences on Science and World Affairs. But he's also made his remarkable mind available to, I think, every science advisor to a president of the United States since President Truman's. Uh, and that includes me. And I have to tell you that Dick Garwin is regularly sitting in the Office of Science and Technology Policy providing advice uh, to me and my colleagues on some of the most vexing and intricate technical issues in science and public policy of our time. Uh, in this administration, he was also a member of the, uh, of the team of experts nationally that Steve Chu and I put together to think about the science of plugging the Gulf oil spill. He was one of the first people we thought of in putting together another such ad hoc team of the leading nuclear safety experts in the country to reflect on how we could help our Japanese colleagues deal with the Fukushima nuclear accident. And I should mention that his service to the Office of Science and Technology Policy as a consultant is, as is his want, unpaid. Uh, Dick has never told any of us, any of the many advisees who he has advised over his extraordinary career, he's never told any of us anything but the unvarnished truth as he saw it. And I think it is Dick's unparalleled and totally unimpeachable integrity and his unflinching candor that has been as much his hallmark as his formidable intellect. And so it really is a great pleasure uh, to turn the podium over to my good friend and longtime colleague, Dick Garwin. Uh, thanks, John, for your kind remarks. It's an honor and an opportunity for me to be able to bestow the first of this new award series on uh, Richard A. Meserve, ninth president of the Carnegie Institution for Science. He was a natural choice. We didn't have to pay his travel expenses. Just... <laughs> but in addition, he's had an illustrious career. He's presented the FAS Award for his many and important contributions over the years in public service, inside and especially outside of government. Dick is unusual, to say the least, in combining interests and expertise in science, law, and public policy. Most recently, he's been serving on the Blue Ribbon Commission on America's Nuclear Future, established by our own Secretary Chu uh, at the direction of President Obama. He also chairs the International Nuclear Safety Group, chartered by the International Atomic Energy Commission Agency. Sorry, He chaired the Nuclear Regulatory Commission under both Presidents Clinton and Bush, a difficult and contentious role. As you recall, this included the events of September 11, 2001, a traumatic, traumatic experience for anyone in government, but in which the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and the nuclear power sector had a special role. Under his chairmanship, the NRC created in 2002 the Office of Nuclear Security and Incident Response. It's difficult to see how NRC had done without that until that point, but it's a welcome addition. I worked on the Natu National Research Council, that is the National Academies NRC Committee, that wrote the 2002 volume, Making the Nation Safer, the Role of Science and Technology in Counter Countering Terrorism, and also on his chapter one dealing with the nuclear power sector. Much remains to be done, and I hope that Dick Meserve will contribute to the solution. I work, worked with him also early on in con connection with his position as legal counsel to Frank Press, then President's science advisor. 
and then briefly in the fall of 1986 when he chaired Post Chernobyl, a committee on the safety of Department of Energy reactors. On April 26, 1986, the Unit 4 reactor at the Chernobyl site in the Ukraine suffered a disastrous accident that ultimately spewed much of the core's load of radioactivity over the European Soviet Union and Western Europe. Although the message in many quarters was that the Soviet RBMK reactors had no analog in the West, Dick Meserve was asked by National Academy of Sciences President and National Research Council head, the same Frank Press, to chair a, commission, a committee looking at the safety of DOE reactors in the light of Chernobyl. I was pleased to serve on this committee for six months or so and welcome the technically informed and independent judgment it was exercising in this important area. Dick's contributions have been recognized by a membership in many organizations, including National Academy of Engineering, and most recently by foreign membership in the Russian Academy of Sciences. I do know of his uh, very successful defense of the American Physical Society against suits trying to compel release of the identity of referees of uh, submitted papers, and in defending the society against a suit by Gordon and Breach, uh, I suppose for defamation, in which uh, our treasurer, Heinz Barschel, published a comparative analysis of relative value of scientific journals compared with their price. So he has a great background and a great future. I'm glad that the Carnegie uh, Institution for Science uh, recognizes the merit of having its president speak publicly on matters of uh, great concern to all. And now a post-deadline uh, intervention, Washington Post that is. <laughs> Yesterday there was a paper, uh, an article published, of which I became aware at 5.30 this evening. <laughs> about some emails uh, that Secretary Chu's group of experts uh, sent, uh, also from the NRC, uh, Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and it quoted famed scientist Richard L. Garwin <laughs> <laughs> as proposing to use explosives to break open the containment of uh, one of the Fukushima reactors in order to get cooling water onto the reactor pressure vessel. And it quoted a uh, an NRC staffer is saying that was crazy. Well, I think Steve Muffson has lost the notes of his January 11 telephone conversation with me, in which I explained that this was not an uh, explosion, this was a uh, shaped charge, either the 15 pound uh, M2A3 of the Corps of Engineers of the U.S. Army, and you can look it up. <laughs> and it says in the table, that it will uh, make a hole through 36 inches of concrete, two inches in diameter. And if you do that with proper preparation, then you have two holes maybe, one in which you can put a, a bladder to inflate so that the water goes into the uh, reactor uh, containment and onto the reactor pressure vessel and cools the reactor. So I think that it is, uh, you know, trial and error from which we, we should all learn as to how these things are done in government and how the press reports them. And uh, on, my, on the FAS website, which has been hosting for many decades uh, what would be called a blog, except nobody can comment on it, uh, my papers and presentations, you'll find the full story. So it gives me great pleasure to convey to Dick Meserve the first Richard L. Garvin Award for Public Service. Thank you. Thank you, and I'd like to welcome you all to the Carnegie Institution. I better clear up right at the beginning something that uh, maybe creates a misunderstanding. It was not a condition for the use of this building that the first award uh, be delivered to me. Uh, I am really pleased to receive this award today and particularly to receive it from Dick Garwin. You know, he really, as John has indicated, has had an astonishing role 
and in providing advice in science and technology in a whole variety of areas for over 60 years. His range has included arms control, energy policy, anti-submarine warfare, military and civil aircraft, ballistic missile threats, satellite reconnaissance, new technologies in healthcare, terrorist threat, and no doubt many, many more that I don't even know about. And he has done this through an astonishing array of different organizations. The ones I'm most familiar with are the, his roles at the National Academy of Sciences, where I know that he has participated in over 30 different studies over the years. Uh, and he was a founding member of the Committee on International Security and Arms Control, and he's still a member, which has had an enormously important role over the years in our efforts in that area particularly at a time when this was the, really the only vehicle by which we could communicate with the then Soviet Union. Uh, he is uh, uh, just an astonishing person in his contributions, and I'm pleased to have my name associated with his for that reason alone. But it turns out that, uh, that we have had some personal interactions over the years. As Dick has indicated that when I was working at the Science Advisor's office, I can remember I had a rather quiet office in the new executive office building and I was very flattered when he came and we spent about 45 minutes or an hour talking about energy policy, just the two of us. He was very famous at the time, even then. And, uh, you know, it was uh, uh, really, a, for me, sort of a sense of, of being in Washington that I had somebody who had been so central, been an advisor, spending time with me. You know, uh, John Holdren has indicated a wide range of areas in which Dick has contributed and the, the characteristics that enabled that and involved not only intellect, uh, capacity to be candor, a great sense of public service, but there is another aspect to him that perhaps is revealed by this story that was in the Washington Post yesterday, which has now been corrected. And that is, is that Dick is really famous as someone who was prepared to think outside the box unconstrained by convention. He has, uh, over his whole career, demonstrated a willingness to approach problems in novel ways. And I know from dealing with him myself in my role, various roles at the National Academies, because he does that, he requires the people who are dealing with him, interacting with him, and listening to, them, to him to think beyond their own, to examine their own assumptions. And uh, this sort of uh, opening the possibilities that Dick has always brought to the committees, I think, often leads to novel and important solutions. So I am extraordinarily pleased to be the recipient of this prize and it's issued in his name, and it's even more valuable to me because I've had the opportunity to receive it from him. I would like to, they've told me that I have a few minutes to say something about a particular problem, and I have to, add, after all the nice thing I've said about Dick, that he hasn't solved all the problems. Uh, there are some that's left for the rest of us. And I, I'd like to just say a few words about something that has engaged me in my role with the IAEA over the last several years. And given the limitations of the time, I'm just going to define the problem for you in the hope to intrigue and engage you in helping to find a solution. I think one of the real challenges that we confront has to do with what are called the new entrant states. These are countries that do not currently have nuclear power plants, but have indicated an intention to acquire one. The IEA has said that there are 60 such countries. We have about 30 countries today uh, that have nuclear power plants, but the IEA says that about 60 countries that don't have them have, have approached the IEA for information. And their estimate is that about 15 of those countries will build nuclear power plants over the next sec uh, decade or so. We know about the completion of Iran's first power plant, the Bushehr plant. There are contracts with vendors in uh, Turkey and the United Arab Emirates, uh, contracts that are being, I think, consummated in Vietnam, uh, aggressive efforts to introduce nuclear power in Belarus, Chile, Egypt, Indonesia, Jordan, uh, Lithuania, Malaysia, Morocco, Poland. Uh, so we have uh, a wide number of countries with no experience with nuclear power that have indicated an intention to proceed. And the challenge arises from the three S's. 
safety, security, and safeguards. Safety, the danger and challenges is that these countries have little sophistication with a technology as sophisticated as, as nuclear power. They have nothing else in their economy that is at all similar. They don't have an infrastructure. They don't have the educational institutions. Uh, they don't have the familiarity with uh, operating in that sort of a world. And as we have discovered, it's hard even for sophisticated countries to be successful. We learned that as a result of TMI. The Japanese have learned that as a result of Fukushima. There's a central element, which is a safety culture, that safety has to be the highest priority that the US learned after Three Mile Island. The Japanese have certainly learned after Fukushima. Uh, and it requires entirely different attitudes towards safety than I believe exists culturally in many of these countries. And I've found in dealing with them myself, it's very hard to convince them that we're actually serious, that this is a real thing, that it isn't just sort of a motherhood type of claim. The second S, of course, is security. Scott Sagan is here. He's written extensively on the fact that many of these plants are going to be built in dangerous parts of the world, in countries of political turmoil, that countries are not democracies, and it will be a challenge for them to ensure security. And there's certainly is the possibility of safeguards challenges. With the access to nuclear technology, there is a capacity or danger that over time some of these countries may want to pursue their own weapons programs. Reactors, of course, are not the fundamental problem from a safeguards point of view. But as they develop sophistication uh, with nuclear technology, and they, particularly if they get involved in other parts of the nuclear fuel cycle, the challenges will emerge. More enrichment is going to be a certainty because there will be a lot more nuclear power plants. And of course, there's enrichment that is developed as a potential for HEU. And not clear where these, any of these countries will go with reprocessing, but of course that opens the door for plutonium. So it's a major challenge to bring this group of countries to a level where we are comfortable with their accomplishment of their responsibilities with regard to the three S's. It's complicated right now. Because the center of gravity in civilian nuclear technology is a moving away from the traditional countries that have led the way. We are only going to build a handful of plants in the United States over the next decade, largely because of the price of natural gas. Significant construction is unlikely in Europe, in large part because of Fukushima. But there will be, and there certainly will be, lots of construction in Russia, China, India, and perhaps in Korea. Those countries have or will have export capability. The US and like-minded countries do, I think, have to worry about how, what kind of influence we will have as the market for nuclear technology starts to center on countries like Russia, China, and India. Now, there are solutions. I think they're going to be very hard to come by. They clearly involve building deeper and stronger international institutions. Of course, they also involve is something that uh, General Scowcroft and the Blue Ribbon Commission has uh, emphasized the need for us to get our own nuclear house in order. It's uh, not going to be easy, but this is a challenge that must be met. We need more Dick Garwins to help us find the path. And again, thank you. I am extraordinarily pleased to receive this award. And I'm very thankful to the Federation of American Scientists and to Dick. Well, in recognizing Dick Garwin earlier, I, I failed uh, to recognize Lois Garwin and to thank her for lending Dick Garwin to the nation and the world uh, to the extraordinary extent that she did. And in that same connection, I have to thank Jean Chu uh, for lending us Steve Chu uh, to the extraordinary extent that she has. Uh, it is my pleasure now to, uh, to introduce uh, Steve Chu as the uh, winner of this year's Hans Bethe Award. 
Uh, and I have to say that it's been my great pleasure to know Steve Chu before either one of us was honorable. Uh, we, um, <laughs> I won't go into that any further. I'm also, <laughs> I'm also not going to read to you uh, Steve Chu's biography, just as I didn't read Dick Garwin's. Uh, Steve's is also absolutely extraordinary. It's in your programs. I recommend it to you. I will just mention a few points. Uh, he is uh, the only Nobel laureate uh, to be uh, appointed to the cabinet of the President of the United States, of any President of the United States. Uh, he's uh, only the second Chinese American to be appointed to a cabinet uh, of a President of the United States. Uh, another thing I want to mention that you may not uh, all know because it wasn't in the printed biography in this program is that uh, when Steve was doing his PhD in physics at UC Berkeley, he was supported by a National Science Foundation Graduate Research Fellowship. And that shows you what an important thing the National Science Foundation and its support of brilliant graduate students can be. Uh, that's where we got our Secretary of Energy, as well as uh, one of our distinguished Nobel laureates. Uh, the other thing about Steve that, um, that I find absolutely extraordinary is he, had, he has continued to do pioneering work in science after becoming the Secretary of Energy. You know, you would think that the President's Science Advisor and the Secretary of Energy, when they do get together, would talk about just the compelling energy and science policy issues of our time, and we do talk about those things. But it's often the case that when Steve and I get together, the first thing he brings up to me, he said, I have to tell you about the research I'm doing. We've just sent this paper off to Nature, and um, it's absolutely extraordinary. I can't imagine uh, anybody else who can take on the enormous responsibilities of the Secretary of Energy in its huge domain across energy, fundamental science, nuclear weapons, waste management, environmental cleanup, and still find time to write pioneering papers in physics. But that is uh, Steve Chu. I'll tell you one other story about Steve. At the first cabinet meeting in the Obama administration, the president went around the cabinet table asking each person for an observation. And when he came to Steve Chu, Steve said, I've discovered a new law of motion at the Department of Energy. Any program in motion comes to a stop. <laughs> and I want to tell you that Steve Chu has changed that at the Department of Energy. He puts new programs into motion and they don't stop. It is, uh, it is just an enormous pleasure and an honor to turn the podium over to my friend and our extraordinary Secretary of Energy, the Honorable Steve Chu. Thank, thank you, John. Um, actually, I'm surprised you remembered that quote, but the full quote was, I've discovered the new law of motion, a body in a body in motion will come to a stop unless continually pushed. Um, anyway, first let me make some spontaneous remarks before I launch into my prepared remarks, which I not only take very seriously, but I have to say, you know, any opportunity I have to address a bunch of scientists, um, and especially um, altruistic motivated scientists who want to serve our country, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to take the opportunity. Um, they gave me this clock. I thought it's because they are, they're going to limit me to 15 minutes, but it's not ticking, so that's the good news. <laughs> um, but before I, before I launch in, I want to say a few things. Um, uh, first, I'm delighted to be here. I'm very honored to be here and to have this award. Uh, to also share the stage with, with the Federation of American Scientists, uh, but especially to share the stage with uh, John Holdren, uh, Dick Arwin, Richard Reserve. I'm gonna, I can tell you lots of stories, but I'm just going to tell you one, or a couple. <laughs> um, uh, what, what Dick Reserve said about this unsolved problem is absolutely true. To that, I will add one other part uh, of, you know, and all the great work the Federation has done in arms control and nonproliferation. Uh, how do you develop nuclear power in a way that would be proliferation resistant, that would be safe, 
uh, and that would be secure. And there's a back end of the fuel cycle, which also has to be considered and solved. And to that, I mean, there are several people here, uh, Brent Scowcroft uh, and Lee Hamilton chaired a very, very important uh, uh, study for two years, uh, Dick Mazur, Susan Eisenhower, I think that's, are there any others I'm uh, for omitting? Okay, yes, thank you, uh, who are also here. Uh, incredible study, very important study. That's the fourth part of this issue. <laughs> but um, one quick story about Dick Arwin. As John mentioned, you know, he was the name that immediately popped up uh, as Dick Meserve said, uh, we wanted really out-of-the-box thinkers. And his name came forward, Dick Arwin's name came forward in many corners. And so being the person I am, I said, yeah, yeah, he's a brilliant guy, but, um, you know, biology and age has their way. Uh, is he still as brilliant as he used to be? And I found out firsthand in many days in Houston, many nights and email conversations, yes he is. <laughs> and of all the, prop, of all the attributes uh, that you heard about, he's also um, wonderfully, brutally honest. <laughs> that is actually great because in those brainstorming sessions and Makano, in those brainstorming sessions and Fukushima, that's what we wanted we want to throw out all sorts of ideas on the table, and we wanted everybody to lambast them, tell them, no, this is really the stupidest thing, or to take a half-baked idea and to turn it into a fully-baked idea. And so those were really great times that we were having, and I really appreciate all that you did, Dick, uh, on those two things, but on many other things uh, that you've served the country. So it's wonderful. Now, let me start on what I want to talk about. I want to talk about the role of science in, and innovation in helping solve the energy challenge. And I throw this picture of um, um, taken by Apollo 8 Earthrise to remind you that um, this is something we have to think about. You know, there's, and the glaring lesson to be learned from this picture is there's a bleak lunar landscape, there's a very wonderful picture of Earth, and there's nowhere else to go. <laughs> and I think that has to be uh, considered. Now, let me talk about some innovations in transportation that have really altered the world. One of my favorite paintings, but if you think about the Industrial Revolution and how energy came about and how it enabled the horse to be replaced by the iron horse, and how it enabled uh, sailing ships uh, to be replaced by uh, steam-powered coal fossil burning ships. Uh, it was remarkably a, really a dawn of a new era, a setting of the sun on some other eras, but it had a profound impact. Um, I want to spend two minutes on airplanes. I want to remind you of some history of the airplane um, for a number of reasons. But the history doesn't start with the Wright brothers. It starts a little bit earlier than that with Samuel Langley um, of the Smithsonian Institution, got a $50,000 grant from the War Department, um, which was a lot of money in those days, to develop uh, a human-powered, heavy-in-the-air machine that would, an airplane. Um, why? Because he was the leading innovator in uh, power gliders. And it, they just said, scale it up, make it carry human. We could be, uh, that would be wonderful. And in those days, uh, conflict of interest didn't seem to be a problem. So even though he was secretary of the Smithsonian, the Smithsonian gave him $20,000. Um, so he set about doing this and, and worked out of Washington. Uh, this is uh, the catapult. He would launch an airplane in the Potomac. And uh, the idea was the airplane would launch, or we could go downward, just like in our aircraft carriers, and gather enough speed and lift, and it would carry on. So the idea was that's what the airplanes would do. Unfortunately, this one went that way. <laughs> now, after the second try, December 8, 1903, he said, you know, he was, you know, in the 60s, he said, 
I can't take the strain and stress. The pilot survived, but hey, I'm giving this up. Okay? Now, December 8, 1903. Nine days later, the Wright brothers succeeded without government funds, without any government support. Members of Congress were outraged. <laughs> <laughs> The government can't pick winners. What are you doing messing with the private sector? Just, just stand back and, and watch the genius of American innovation uh, take hold. Some things don't change. So <laughs> let me just continue the story. Um, the federal support was really critical for the development of the airplanes. Yes, they did it all on their own. Two young people uh, from, who built bicycles. But they wanted to transition from building bicycles to making airplanes. Who was their first customer? Who was virtually their only customer? The US government. And they bought a lot of airplanes from the Wright brothers, military flyers. Unfortunately, you know, most of them actually crashed. And the pilots weren't as lucky as Langley's pilots. Now, when the US entered World War I, we were hopelessly behind. Why? Because in 1917, the Allies convinced us not to build US-designed airplanes, either Wright or Curtis or anybody. They convinced us to build British airplanes, French airplanes, in American factories. And we agreed. They were much better. In 1906, the Wright brothers in the tour of Europe we're absolutely the rulers of the sky. They can actually make an airplane that would go up, stay up for an hour, turn around, do figure eights, all this stuff. So what happened? Well, it's very complicated. And uh, one of the reasons was between 1908 and 1913, the United States ranked 14th in government investment in aviation. Even though the military was selling, buying all the airplanes from Curtis and from Wright, we were behind. Now, you could say, OK, we were behind because Europe was arming Germany, France, Russia, Great Britain. OK, fine. But we were 14th. So who are some of the other countries? Bulgaria, Greece, Japan, Chile, Spain, and Brazil. And it showed. All right? So the thing that private sector can take care of itself and not do anything uh, needs to be reexamined in terms of key emerging industries. Um, and after World War I, the United States woke up. They did not say, yeah, we invented the airplane, but it's OK. We're going to buy airplanes from other countries because you know, we're not going to be able to compete in the aircraft industry. They said, no, we need to get this lead back for national security reasons. We get the need back. Actually, very conscious private sector potential business. They allowed private companies to carry the precious US mail. They actually set up an organization that cared about airplane safety and standards and design. Because guess what? Someone wisely said, if they keep on crashing, you're not going to get a commercial business. OK? Let me tell you another story about transportation. Henry Ford. Did Henry Ford invent the automobile? No. Um, he didn't invent the internal combustion engine. Damlin Benz did that. He didn't, actually didn't invent the assembly line or the moving assembly line. He improved upon it. And in his improvement over a period of four or five years before he went into production, they figured out how to make cars um, low cost, high quality, because his vision was he wanted cars not to be a luxury item like Damlin Benz and Peugeot and others in Europe, but they wanted to make cars for the, quote, the great multitudes. And in the peak of, uh, I think it's either the T or the A Ford, in inflation-adjusted dollars, it was $7,000 a car. Okay, And it created a whole new market. And it exploded. So what happened? We didn't invent it. We became the low-cost producer. Sound familiar? Okay, That used to be us, the US. Okay, so. Um, now, this was remarkable because this new technology and all the infrastructure required, paved roads, uh, fueling infrastructure, all this stuff happened as fast as anything you've seen in major technology shifts. If you look in photos in the 
late 1890s, mid 1890s, there were mostly horse-drawn carriages and horses everywhere, including cities. 20 years later, 25 years later, they were dominated by cars. There were a few straggler streetcars in the cities, but they were taken care of as well, but never mind that story. Um, this was a very, very rapid transformation, especially since it required huge changes in infrastructure. Now, it was automobile technology, the internal combustion engine, liquid fuels, were really had technological advantages, but I have to say they were assisted by a serious environmental pollution problem that made that transition much faster. What is that you're thinking of? Well, in New York and Brooklyn, there were 160,000 horses in 19, 1880, and they would produce about three or four million pounds of horse manure a day, and 40,000 gallons of urine horse urine a day. Needless to say, the um, fertilizer market was oversaturated. <laughs> the stuff was piling up in every nook and cranny in New York City. And it was very visible and very noticeable. And that really helped the new technology take over. It was an environmental concern to take it, take it over, okay? It's fascinating, right? Okay, we have another environmental concern. Now, uh, I want to talk a little bit about this because sometimes I've been accused of not talking about climate change. So here, I'm going to talk about climate change. <laughs> and in fact, I've talked about it in about 80 or 90 percent of my talks in the last year and a half. Um, and the Obama administration still remembers this is one of, the, one of the reasons why we want to do this. The other reason is there are incredible economic opportunities. The temperature of the globe is increasing. Do we understand all these little bumps and wiggles? No. Do we understand the long-term trend? I think we do. So let me be very simple about that. But before that, I want to tell you about some observations. In the 80s and 90s, there was predictions about how fast the sea level would rise. And uh, this was the best estimate of IPCC's conglomeration of all the estimates, with these dotted lines being uh, the I think it's either 90 or 95 percentile range of what could happen. And um, so these predictions were being made from these measurements. We have nice satellite observations and where uh, the climate scientists were not quite right. They were on the border of being wrong. They underestimated how fast the sea level was rising. Um, in part from a lot of reasons, but uh, they only estimated predominantly the sea level will rise due to increase in temperature due to expansion of the water. And they did not put in whether the glaciers would be melted, would run off faster in those early days. And, um, and there was a big uh, debate about that. Uh, these are, by the way, uh, the change from a long ago to now. Uh, and there's new technology. We have two satellites, and we have a bunch of satellites now, very precise satellites. And then using microwave uh, telemetry, they can measure the distance between these two satellites as the satellites pass over in polar orbit, which means they get every part of the world. If these are two satellites and you're going over a mass and there's a little local spot of the mass, it's a little, they perturb the orbits ever so slightly. And you can back out the change in the local gravity measured by these satellites, but it's remarkable the resolution because it's in the scale of tens or 100 kilometers now, not tens, but 100 kilometers. It's the scale of uh, certainly taking apart what Greenland's doing. Big debate about the ice mass in Greenland. There's more precipitation, two to three kilometer thick glacier thing, but is it getting thicker or is it getting thinner? Certainly you see more stuff running off, but is it getting thicker or thinner? Uh, it's getting thinner. It's not only getting thinner, it's getting thinner at an increasing rate, and these wiggles are the summer-winter modulations. Also, this wonderful data is now showing parts of Antarctica doing the same, and the Himalayan Plateau. This is neat stuff. It's no longer looking at the length of a glacier. You can have high-technology stuff saying, hey, it's really happening, by measuring the mass of the ice and snow. Now, you can say, well, this is all great. The climate's changing, but does it really have to do with humans? 
And you've all seen these things of human population zooming through the roof, and you've seen uh, the carbon dioxide emissions from thousands of years back. Uh, and then uh, this is essentially when the Industrial Revolution started. And maybe it's just a coincidence that CO2 and nitrogen oxide, this is again the beginning of the Industrial Revolution and the beginning of the Industrial Revolution for methane, just maybe just a wild coincidence that this happened to be started about the time of the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, if you're skeptical, okay? You've all heard these. So let me tell you very, very quickly that there's more to it than that. Carbon-14 made naturally cosmic rays in the upper atmosphere. It gets embodied in anything living uh, in the world as well as uh, into the oceans, into the trees, into you and I. And now imagine you take that carbon from stuff like biology-generated stuff, and if it normally decays and things get recycled over 50 years, 100 years, a tree falls down, the microbes eat it up, reprocess it. That has 100-year cycles. Oceans could have longer cycles. But suppose you take it and you sequester it for 10 million years, a million years, 100,000 years. It doesn't matter. Much, much longer than the lifetime of carbon-14. The radioactive stuff in that carbon is gone. It's decayed back to nitrogen. Now, if you take that sequestered, you know, you and I, we've been put in a mausoleum for a million years, and we become fossil fuel. And, and, but there's a significant amount of it, and you throw it back up in the atmosphere, what are you going to do? You're going to dilute the amount of radioactive carbon in the atmosphere if there's a lot of carbon that was sequestered more than biological cycling times in the biosphere. So what happened? Well, this is the increase in CO2. And th there's another similar story from carbon-13 because biological organisms take up carbon-13 less fast than non-ones. But let me just stick to carbon-14. This is even, a, it's a cool story. So carbon-14, carbon emission, CO2 in, in the atmosphere going up, carbon-14 ratio of carbon-14 to non-reactive carbon going down. Now, okay, the data runs out in 1952 or three in this plot, but uh, it gets more exciting. Um, uh, in something the FAS has very uh, worked on for many years, atmospheric nuclear testing began. And hydrogen bombs also introduced carbon-14 into the upper atmosphere. And what you see here is that ratio of carbon-14 zooming up as the Soviet Union and the United States predominantly started atmospheric testing. It's in the northern hemisphere, so it increased in the northern hemisphere. These oscillations are the yearly mixing of the upper atmosphere with the lower biosphere. So you can actually resolve that. There's a delay, there's a subtle mixings of northern hemisphere, it takes a year or two. You can see that delay. You can see the uptake of carbon-14 in the oceans, starting with the northern hemisphere oceans, going to the southern hemisphere oceans. And then as this carbon-14 gets mixed in with the biosphere and the oceans, it's going down, and this is all good and so fine. How are we doing? Well, actually, is it going down due to just mixing? No, it's going down too fast. And if you look at the amount of fossil fuel we think we've been putting up since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, but certainly since 1960 to 2010, within 25% uncertainty, it's actually consistent with that dilution of fossil fuel burning. It's 25% uncertainty, you know, and there is some uncertainty. But this has much more human fingerprints than just a coincidence. Now, I can go on for hours telling you about stuff like this. So it's a very much deeper, hey, you know, there's a reasonably high probability that the climate's changing, well documented, and there's a reasonably high probability that it's due to predominantly humans. 
there could be some non-human effects for sure, but this is where we are, okay? And yet, you know, the skeptics are, are uh, still uh, there. Uh, they were there in cigarette smoking for 20 years. So then the question is, can the rise, no, I'm not just saying, by the way, I will be the first to say it's not certain anything I've said, whether you can choose whether it's 80%, 90%, 95% certain, but it's not 50%. <laughs> it's much higher than that. And so there is a risk of some really bad things happening. You don't need to prove it 100% certain. You just have to recognize there's a, good evidence of a reasonable risk. Now, let's go back to the temperature due to an increase in solar energy. Is that a nat that's a natural cause. Here's the global temperature rising, the average, and people say, well, the sun might be increasing its luminosity, and so no, it's got solar cycles of 11 years, but the baseline's pretty good. And then, as I've talked to some members of Congress, and they say, well, what about sunspots? This is, you know, this is visible radiation, and Good question, what about sunspots? We're measuring it all. We're measuring visible radiation, we're re measuring infrared radiation, we're measuring ion radiation, sunspots, we're measuring radio emissions. All those different colors are all the things. 11 year cycle, they're not changing. Energy in the same, energy out less, that's physics. So then the question is, over a 50 or 100 year cycle, let me think, the temperature might increase. Uh, is the burden of proof that the feedbacks would be so perfect that it would keep the temperature completely stable over 50 or 100 years? Or, and there are feedbacks that actually dilute the effect a lot. It could have been much worse if it weren't for those. But it, the question got flipped of where the burden of proof should be. So anyway. Um, natural disasters. This is, I got this from uh, a reinsurance company, Munich Re. Those are insurance companies that uh, insure other companies. And I made this uh, a little bit larger. They divided up these disasters because, you know, insurers of insurance companies don't want to pay out for major disasters. They have geological events, earthquakes, and tsunamis, and things like that. Then they had what they called meteorological events, like storms. Then they had hydrological events, floods. Sounds a lot like storms to me, but you know, I'm not an expert in insurance. And there are climatological events, extreme temperatures, drought, forest fires. And so, ironically, the Munich Re thinks that storms and hydrological events, floods, may not have to do with climate, okay? There are a whole bunch of papers. I'm just gonna point out one. Human contribution to more intense precipitation extremes, uh, nature. And I'll just read it to you. Given that atmospheric water holding capacity is expected to increase roughly exponentially with temperature, and that atmospheric water content is increasing accord with this theoretical expectation, it has been suggested that human influenced global warming may be partly responsible for an increases in heavy precipitation. It's your typical science or nature paper. Um, here we show that human induced increases in greenhouse gases have contributed to the observed intensification of heavy precipitation events. Changes in extreme precipitation projected by models and this is key, may be underestimated because models seem to underestimate the observed increase in heavy precipitation and warming. They got it wrong again, just like this rise in sea level. Okay, they're not perfect. But they got it wrong not the way the climate skeptics say they got it wrong. It's worse. This is the data, A and B, when you see Cold or red or blue, these are extremes in um, rainfall. And they lo looking at uh, heavy, heavy rains one day or five day periods, it's the five day ones that are the killers. Because the first day, the land can absorb it, but if you get three or four or five days, you get major flooding. That's measurement. This ant is the anthropological forcings, which are the carbon increase and it's 
much paler in contrast than the severe events. And then all included natural events, mostly volcano eruptions and things like that that throw up uh, things that uh, change the albedo of the Earth. They have a cooling effect. So if you consider all, uh, if you consider only anthropological as in carbon and methane, uh, it underpredicts. If you consider all, it even further underpredicts the changes. Pause for thought here. Okay? So now climate modelers have been saying this for a long time, 10 or 20 years at least, but they underestimated what's happening. Okay, so that's the bad news. Let me tell you a little bit of good news. We uh, shouldn't give up and there are great opportunities. And let me tell you two things. There's a whole long list of things, but let me tell you about lightweight materials. Materials can actually change how we deal with energy and actually improve our economic prosperity in the United States. Well, let me tell you a story. The Washington Monument is capped in aluminum. Why were we being so cheap for the founder of our country? You know, silver at least, or at least gold plate, but aluminum, you gotta be kidding. Well, actually in 1884, the price of aluminum was a dollar an ounce. The price of gold was $20 an ounce. By way of comparison, the highest skilled craftsman working on the Washington Monument was paid $2 a day. When they made the decision to cap in aluminum, it was a couple of dollars an ounce. Today, what's happened? Aluminum is six cents an ounce. Gold happens to be 1776 an ounce, ironically. <laughs> Plus or minus $100. Um, aluminum was a precious metal. What happened? There was a new way of refining aluminum that transformed aluminum. Aluminum oxide is very abundant. We are working in a new way to refine titanium. Titanium oxide is almost as abundant as aluminum dioxide. Let alone, uh, iron oxide is a little bit more abundant, but it, that's not the issue. The issue is the cost of processing. And we're looking for an electro lytic way of reducing aluminum, uh, titanium dioxide to make it like aluminum. We think we got something, but it's gonna be cool if we do, and if we don't, okay, it's research. But that's something that I think can transform industry and energy efficiency. Airplanes have become much more energy efficient. 707, wonderful airplane. After Boeing got a tanker contract, they decided to make an airplane with windows in it and instead of fuel, they were gonna put seats. And that's how the commercial jet aviation industry started. You look at this, today's jet, it looks kinda of like the 707. There's only one major difference. It only uses 30% of the amount of fuel. Other than that, it's kinda of the same. <laughs> it's pretty cool, okay? Uh, how much better is? Due to a lot of things, due to carbon composites, due to better, it's mostly lighter weighting, carbon composites, a little bit of aerodynamics. Uh, engines, materials, the engines for the amount of fuel consumed, the amount of thrust produced are now 50% better than the engines of the 707. And they're gonna get another 20% better within five years or eight years. It's amazing. A lot of it has to do with materials. Higher strength materials, the blaze and the turbines became single crystal in, by 1990. They became directed single crystal by that time. And as you go to higher temperature materials, you can make them even more efficient. Um, other materials, steel, lowly steel. Steel has been around for hundreds of years. We are, Department of Energy, are funding some projects with the auto industry to say we can reduce the weight of steel, and this was a program to a 2002 to 2009, by 22 to 32% of the weight. Every 10% reduction in weight, you save 7% in gasoline consumption per same performance. Performance means acceleration and same size, okay? It's a big deal, weight. Um, today, 
uh, the auto show, the Hyundai Elantra, it's a fag passenger car. It's a mid-sized car. It gets 40 miles a gallon on a highway. I looked at this car and said, hey, this, you know, how much does this weigh? 3,500 pounds? Sam said, no, it's 26, depending on the engine option, 26 to 2,800 pounds. You gotta be kidding, no. He went, gave me the spec sheet. I came back to the Department of Energy and Googled around and said, yeah, it turns out that's true. It really weighs that little. It's also a pretty good engine, 1.8 liter engine, 150 horsepower. The Dodge Dart being introduced today is 68% high tensile steel. This is steel that if you push on it, it's not gonna give, and how much higher strength is it than the normal mild steels where we make our previous cars only two years ago from? Uh, not 20% better, 30% better, 5X better. Hugely better. Okay, so this is the Dodge Darts, again, a mid-sized car. Uh, it's rumored that it's gonna have an EPA rating of uh, over 40 miles to a gallon. This is me looking at the car with the vice president of Chrysler and the CEO of Chrysler. After five minutes, he walks over to his vice president and says, have you made the sale yet? <laughs> um, lighter weighting is very big. Uh, the engines are doing terrifically. Uh, I was, I went to Ford Research and they're making a 900 cc engine, 0.9 liter engine, 127 horsepower, and the amount of torque of a standard two liter engine. It's this big. It's amazing, okay? Technology is amazing. By the way, they wouldn't be doing this if there wasn't a 55 mile a gallon goal. And they wouldn't be doing, they wouldn't even be considering high tensile strength steel if it weren't for that. And I guarantee you that is absolutely true, okay? Now, who are the high tensile st strength manufacturers that dominate the world? Alcatraz Middle, Severstal, Dyson Krupp. That's an Indian-based company. That's a Russian-based company. That's a German-based company, okay? <laughs> um, there is a potential for capturing back high strength steel, but we let it go, not decades ago, but a half a century ago. Uh, where you have, this is the mild steel we used to make our cars with only two or three years ago in terms of tensile strength. How much force can it sustain before it collapses? These are the kind of steels they're introducing today. That's 150 to 200 megapascals, and now you're talking 1,000. But you want it to be formable and to be stampable, and then you want to imbue it with those strengths. Okay, so here's the cool thing. We understand, you know, metallurgy is shake, bake, and pound, right? Hammer, whatever. We understand the nano and mesoscopical processes that give it, imbue it with those properties, but we can't actually predict at a fundamental level what happens. We understand if you make these little nanostructures and mesostructures, this is what happens. Very small impurities of cobalt and vanadium and all these things, they form metal oxides. But we have amazing diagnostics. We have computational tools, but they haven't been used to full advantage. We have incredible high performance capabilities in our national labs that can you maybe simulate what's really going on and do those experiments. So there's again an opportunity for US prosperity. One last thing, I know you're getting bored, I wanna talk about photovoltaic materials. The cost of photovoltaic modules, solar energy, is plunging. This is a logarithmic curve, and so this is this, is, this price, uh, selling price in $2,000 per watt used to be about $25 a watt. And this is a learning curve. As you get produce more and more of this stuff, uh, it goes down and down. There's a little bump. This bump happened to do with uh, very generous subsidies in Germany. Uh, there was a, a big demand. The market adjusted and went down. This is a new technology, a particular thin film called CAD Telluride. This was um, a prediction made in 2010 for what the price of uh, silicon photovoltaics would be. Um, and they thought by 2015, it could be as low as a dollar watt. 
very, you know, based on this learning curve, see that it's actually faster than the slope. So they would say, hey, you know, progress is going to increase. Okay, what happened? This is what happened. The learning curve actually went from uh, $4 a watt per module in 2006 or 7 uh, to, uh, to January 2012, it's under a dollar. There was a reduction of 75 to 80 percent in three years. And because of that, technology plus competition, there was a shakeout. So that's what's happened. Um, this is again, this is um, 2004, it was $8 a watt, including all the other things in the installation, the land use for utility scale solar. Um, by 2010, it was a little less than $4 a watt. Now the Department of Energy wants it to be a dollar a watt. And we thought that perhaps we could have as a goal uh, 50, you know, by the end of the decade, maybe 50 cents a watt, but we're a little bit ahead of schedule. As I said, it's about 90 cents a watt now. Um, and so uh, we, now the cost of solar modules is less than half of the full cost of a big installation. It's the, all the other stuff. And so we're working very hard to reduce all the other stuff as well as the technology. Uh, the module improvement is still racing ahead with lightning speed. Things that used to be 12% efficient are now 14.5 precision in CAD Telluride. Silicon that used to, polysilicon used to be 16% efficient. I've got to tell you this story. Uh, crystalline silicon went from 1922. Poly went from 14 to 16. CAD Telluride 12 to 14. Gamma arsenide is still not commercially viable, but we're working on liftoff technologies. But let me tell you, sorry, silicon, if you want to grow really high quality NASA silicon, you take a single seed and molten silicon, you draw it out, and you make a single perfect crystal. It costs a lot of money, then you saw it up in the wafers. So there's one U.S. company that's dominant in that technology, 22% efficient, but it's high cost. The normal way of building silicon is you dump this polysilicon in this big oven, you melt it up, you slowly cool it, and you get this polysilicon stuff. That's what polysilicon looks like, many different crystals. Really cheap, then you take this big hunk of silicon, you saw up in the little things, and you cut into wafers, okay? In 2007, the Department of Energy sponsored some research with BP Solar in America, said, you know, if you take this really cheap way of making it and you put in a little, so, and you cool it really slowly, can you make the polycrystalline big, bigger and bigger domains so maybe you can get big hunks of single crystal silicon with the cheap way? And lo and behold, they, as an R&D effort, they actually got uh, such high quality silicon this way that uh, they were getting 20 percent efficiency but then they lost their appetite because of the competition especially from China so BP Solar pulled out. They sold the patents to a German company. We were try in instrumental in, in making sure that US had some say in those patents and but anyway but you know what China took up that technology stayed with it and are about to produce this silicon with this bulk cheap way of making it where they're gonna get at least half of it yield is single crystalline quality, which means you go to 20, 21%, okay? So the competition's fierce. Look at the timelines. This is one year, two years, three years, and go to the web and I actually read Chinese papers, research papers, actually describing how they can tickle it. They're publishing, okay? But I think we still can do this, but we can't give up. But it is fierce competition. Why is it fierce competition? Because at a dollar watt, electricity is going to be as cheap as any form of new energy, including natural gas, at $4 a million BTU. Okay? And when that happens, it's a whole new world. It explodes. So anyway. I'm going to skip biofuels for one thing. There's lots of great stuff going on, but we have to industrialize raising energy crops. And by industrialize, I mean the following. This is wheat. 
There's a combine, it threshes it, it dumps the wheat into a tractor. The tractor takes it to a local elevator, 30, 40 mile radius. From that elevator, you either have big trucks or trains, and you can ship this wheat all over the world. And $100 a ton, you will ship wheat and corn and chickens all over the world. It's been industrialized. So if you can get this technology in biofuels uh, automated, the first time you touch it is the most important part, it turns out. It's at least as important as all the clever genetic modification of bacteria to break down cellulose and make it into diesel fuel. You gotta get this one right, too. Brazil has industrialized sugarcane to ethanol. Over 17, 1975 to 2003, the yield per acre of sugarcane has tripled. The amount of nitrogen fertilizer you have to put in has decreased tremendously, but they bred sugarcane. Sugarcane is a perennial and it fixes a lot of its own nitrogen, but they made it fix more of its own nitrogen, less fertilizer. Now, it's the first touch. They used to chop the sugarcane with machetes, put it on some trucks that probably police in the United States would stop this truck from delivering stuff. Uh, but that's in Brazil. Uh, but that's the beginning. Now what do they do? They've got the combine. They mow it down, they thrash it, they put the sh sugar into this, they throw the leaves back in the field because that doesn't high yield, and there's a little bit of fertilizer there. They take these little trucks, they lay load it onto big trucks, that are truck trains, all automated, and they deliver to the refinery that makes the sugar, and now they're using the sugar, the, after they squeeze out the sugar to make that into ethanol, they're now pilot plant being made, DOE research started this, to actually convert the sugar into drop in diesel fuel replacement. They're also working on converting the cellulose into fuels, okay? They've industrialized it. Okay, so we too can do this, but we are not there yet. So these are all good news stories. I think we do have an opportunity. We need a second industrial revolution, and a revolution that can give us the energy the world wants and needs, but without the equivalent of the horse manure, the carbon dioxide and the greenhouse gases. And, uh, and it's gonna be led by discovery invention and the industrialization of this, and this is, very important for not only the posterity and future of the United States, but of the world. Uh, this is a great scientific challenge. Um, and it's the, the people who work on this will actually do something that will confer the greatest benefit on mankind. Now, for those of you who don't recognize that quote, that quote is from the will of Alfred Nobel because there will be Nobel Prizes in the stuff that we have to solve, okay? And we will need it, and it's, if necessity is the mother of an all invention, this is a big necessity, and it will be vital to our prosperity, and we have all the stuff, the innovation, the intellectual know-how, the research universities, the national labs, all the pieces. So here it is in front of us. And I remind you of that picture of the earth. And there's nowhere else to go. Thank you. Holdren gets the ticking clock. Right. <laughs> You get the clock. You failed as a timekeeper. You get the clock. <laughs> right. Dr. Chu gets the flag. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for being here. It's been an extraordinary event. It's been great to honor Dr. Meserve and Dr. Chu and have Dr. Garman and Dr. Holdren here and all these distinguished guests. Thank, uh, join me once again for thanking all of them and for all of you for being here. Thank you.